Welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. I'm Sunny Agarwal, and I'm here today with State Layer. State Layer is a guest host today. He is a, if, uh, for anyone who doesn't know him, uh, kind of NGMI, I guess, but you know, for anyone who doesn't, he is a prolific Twitter anon who it, you know, just has awesome thoughts on crypto and wanted to come on today and uh, guest host an episode. And so uh, here he is today. Today, we're speaking with Joey Santoro. He's the founder of Fade Protocol, uh, which is a stable coin being built on Ethereum and takes a lot of ideas in the you know, long lineage of stable coins and applies them, uh, which we'll learn about today. But uh, so before we talk about Joey about Faye, we'd like to tell you a little bit about our sponsors for this week. Uh, so the first up is Tally. Tally is a new wallet for Web3 and DeFi that sees the wallet as a public good. Think of it like a community-owned alternative to MetaMask. It has all the same features as MetaMask, but the difference is that it's 100% open source under a GPL v3 license. And it's also 100% user-owned with all the profits flowing to the community, not a corporation. The launch of Tally is coming in the new year, but there's an early version available right now called the Tally Community Edition, uh, which is before the, lo- before the DAO launches on December 15th. You know, and because it's this community wallet, they're they're ready for feedback and want to know how they can improve. So, you know, if you have any features that you're looking for in your ideal wallet or something that annoys you about your current wallet, you should, uh, you know, post on the Discord and let them know. And so that way it can be a really community oriented run project. Uh, The community calls feature a new partner each week and have about 500 uh, people uh, attending. And so all the info you need is at tally.cash. Also sponsoring today is Gnosis Safe. Uh, Digital assets today on Web3 are usually controlled by a single private key. I hope the tribe multi-sig or something is not. Um, But, uh, and this is a challenge because single private keys are often lost or compromised and all the funds are gone. Um, And they often have to trust the individuals holding these private keys to like, you know, govern them. Um, Gnosis Safe solves this problem by being a smart wallet that enables users to control digital assets with much more granular permissions involving multiple private keys, a subset of which is required for executing transactions. These keys can then be stored on a different wallet or software wallets uh, and even shared across multiple people. Gnosis Safe's extra layer of security and personalization make it the most trusted Web3 asset management solution for individuals, teams, and DAOs, and it's already being used to store over $100 billion US dollars worth of digital assets today. On top of that, Gnosis Safe also provides opportunities for developers to plug into the platform and build their own dApps and permissionless modules. Visit gnosis-safe.io to learn more and get started with setting up your own safe today. Cool. So, uh, Joey, welcome to the podcast. Um, I'd like to, you know, start off just with a disclaimer that I was an investor in Faye. So, you, uh, you know, that, that should tell everyone that I love Faye a lot, and which is why I'm so excited for this episode, but just want to give a fair disclaimer before uh, jumping in. So, Joey, welcome onto the show. Hey, thanks, Sonny. Um, it's, it's good to be here. And yeah, it's been a, it's been a ride. Been, you know, awesome like having you around in state too. He, he hopped in later when it wasn't cool. And, and so <laughs> for, for that, I think he brings a, a very good context as well. So um, yeah, very excited to be here. You wanna maybe uh, start off with just telling us a little bit about your background and you know what got you into crypto in the first place? What were you doing before? I think we first met at the SF Blockchain Week hackathon a few years ago, uh, back in like 2019 and you were like, uh, com- you were building something there. Was that your first foray into crypto, or was there stuff you were doing before that too? Um, yeah, that was my that was my first time building something sort of in public. But I've been into crypto Ethereum since like 2017. I definitely hopped in that last you know cycle, and I was trading shit coins. I was you know buying a bunch of stuff and losing money, making money all over the place. After everything went down. Um, I maintained a very strong, you know, intellectual love for Ethereum and for all the apps that were being built. Back then it was basically just Compound and MakerDAO um, and, you know, Uniswap. But then like slowly, like more apps came out, um, read every white paper I could get my hands on. I even taught a class on Solidity at at, at Duke where I went to school. And, um, And then when I graduated, I came out to the Bay. They had the SF Blockchain Week. We built a really cool, like, 
it was kind of like Furu combo or like uh, I don't know, like like Instadap or whatever, where you could like chain actions, and it was built on Ave using their flash loans, which I thought were the coolest thing ever. Like when I the, when I first heard of flash loans, I was like, this is gonna be sick, and it feels like people like now flash loans are just like oh you got rugged because there was some bug that a flash loan exploited. And that's like why flash loans are still relevant. But anyway, um, very, very technical. I'm a developer. I wrote all the code for Fav1 um, and a lot of the code for V2, but now we have some, some sweet devs on the team that aren't just me. Um, and yeah, like always trying to innovate. I care a lot about DeFi and where we're going and that's kind of how I got here and how I built Fav. So I'm happy to jam more on that as we, um, you know, as we, as we chat. Cool. And so then how did you, you know, in this process, how did you choose to, you know, I remember you were working on the th some things around flash loans and stuff. Uh, how did you decide to like, you know, stable coins? That's what I want to go fix stable coins, as opposed to the many other things you could be doing. Yeah, so I think though, like when you're a builder, um, like at heart, the way that you want to go about like starting a project is you have to see a need that you feel like you're the right person to solve. And so it wasn't that I'm like obsessed with stable coins or anything. Like I just care about DeFi and crypto. And I saw that like our options were Tether, ew, USDC, like cool, but you know, not long-term and DAI, which was like slowly becoming not cool. Like I still love MakerDAO. I think it's like, you know, foundational infrastructure, but at least, you know, especially in like the 2020 time, MakerDAO was not like the coolest thing in DeFi at all. And I think that they've really like, you know, made some strong moves, kind of they're setting themselves up to do, you know, real world assets and a lot of like ESG stuff. I think that's a really cool niche that I think they'll continue to fill um, and they'll continue, continue to be dominant. But anyway, like those were the options and I was like not very inspired. And I saw all these cool lending markets and derivatives and things popping up, but stable coins were going nowhere. Um, and then there was all these algo coins that were like really shaking it up those were not going to make it like I was involved in empty said dollar. Um, you know, I did a little bit of development work there. Um, and I, I tried to make it like less of a Ponzi and more of an actual stable coin, but you know, we saw how that turned out. Um, and it was really cool cause it was a super decentralized project. It really got my, like my brain kind of thinking about stable coins. And I realized that like, where we want to go with stable coins, we want to have like asset backed stable coins that have more algorithmic management, um redeemability we want to have like protocol controlled liquidity that was a big theme and one of the reasons why empty set dollar failed versus things like olympus are kicking ass right now is because of protocol owned liquidity so that was a big idea behind Faye. and i was like why is no one doing this i'm gonna quit my job as an enterprise software engineer and just like go build it and that that's how that's how we got here so it wasn't like i was obsessed with stable coins but i was very much like trying to follow the puck in DeFi, and Fay is just kind of you know, it was so in the zeitgeist that we had the crazy launch that we're going to talk about. And that's because it was like, we hit, we hit it on the nose with the idea, but then the execution was, you know, a little bit behind the idea, at least in the, in the initial stages, but V 2 is going to be really sick. And so I'm, I'm super excited to just like tell the whole story and, and, and where we are now. Cool. Yeah. Maybe you want, 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 want to, let's jump into that story. So like, you know, okay. So let's say, what is it, November 2020, ESD just fell over and you are like, okay, I want, I'm going to take these learnings and start to do something with it. What was the story? What was what were the steps? Did you just start working on it by yourself? Did you start to put together a team? Did you come up with the idea first or did you start just like, yeah, what, what was the step from there until, yeah, and you launched relatively pretty fast, right? Because you went all from like, you know, almost I, idea to, you know, raising and launching within what, three to four months? Yeah, so the, the I was involved in Empty Set Dollar and call it October 2020. Um, and I had the idea for Faye like right around the end of October. So um, it was literally like, I was in Empty Set Dollar. I was like, guys, we need protocol owned liquidity. And they were like, eh, whatever. Let's just keep incentivizing people. They were like having a lot of fun. And Empty Set Dollar continued to blow up through December like in a good way, like, I mean, not in a good way, but in like a TVL kind of way, like it went up to like 600 million um, supply. And that's while I was building Faye because I I realized like MBSet dollars 
is probably not going to make it. They actually wanted me to build their V2 or be at least be one of the devs on V2. And um, I told them like, oh, I'm, I'm busy with work, <laughs> but I was building Faye. <laughs> and, um, and so, um, so yeah, like I had the idea for like protocol owned liquidity. I was, I was jamming on a bunch of mechanisms in my head. Um, if you want to like hear more about like Faye V1, I've done like several podcasts about it. The Delphi one was really good um, as like historical context. But um, the TLDR was the market was like crazy. It was ETH was six hundred dollars when I went in October. By the time we launched, it was two thousand. So we were like really trying to just like get the idea out there. Like it was like a ship or die kind of mentality. In retrospect, that was a mistake, and that was probably the biggest one. Um, which was like we just wanted to get Fay out there because we felt like stable coins. There were so many competitors. You know, Frax was coming out. Olympus, I guess, was like kind of a stable coin, but now it's clearly like not a stable coin, but it's still pretty similar to Faye. Um, and then, you know, empty set dollar V2, you know, they finally shipped that, didn't really go very well. But there was all these other algo coins, so much competition. So it was really like we raised around with, you know, some investors that I like knew and friends. And then Andreessen wanted to invest, and I was like, no, I'm building. And then we did another round like within like a month and a half. And we we probably didn't need to do that round and it definitely attracted a lot of attention and all those backers are are awesome they're cool to work with um but it really elevated the stakes a lot but yeah i would sunny sunny you was sunny within there it elevated the stakes a lot because now like all eyes were on us and um you know we were moving so fast already that um yeah and the market was going crazy it was it was honestly like a surreal experience to be a part of that um you know, very small team, very ambitious idea. And the, so I would say like one of the mistakes was like just trying to get to market as fast as possible. Like just because it was like, that's what everyone was doing. There was so much pressure from like the bull market and all the competition. Um, I would say like do things right. Like take your time, it, like blinders on. That would be like the big lesson there is like um, don't just – do things because you feel like pressure from anyone else, like do things the way that you want to do them because that's the way that you want to do it. That's the, that's like one of the, I call it like two biggest lessons. And then the other one was like, keep things super, super simple. Um, the launch, like, so Fav one itself was very ambitious. The launch was also an ambitious type of launch. I think it was actually super close to being really good, but the, there was a couple of things we did wrong. One was it was uncapped. And two was there was this like weird airdrop that was kind of mixed in with the launch plans um, where people would get like more dollar value than what they put in, in terms of like, so everyone thought, everyone who came into Genesis thought they were going to make 20% immediately. And if you've been around for long enough, you know that that's when you should be very worried. Um, and like, we tried to tell people like, hey, here's how Genesis works. We put out all these articles. We gave spreadsheets. We wanted to like educate people, but it's so hard. The market just like really ran away with it. Um, and then we got so much demand, like way more than we possibly could have expected. We, it was the biggest DeFi launch, I think, in history still to this date. Um, 1.3 billion in ETH. Absolutely nuts. And uh, yeah, just like uh, those are the two big lessons, I'd say. Like don't rush and keep it as simple as possible so that like, you know, people who only look at your thing for 10 seconds before aping can like know what's going to happen. And I, I yeah, there, there's a lot more in there to unpack, but that's kind of the very broad strokes of, um, of what happened. And, uh, and then obviously there was like, that's up until Genesis, right? Then there's a whole, like what happened after we can go there. Um, but yeah, what, like, it looks like you, you unmuted. I'm curious, like, what was it like from your perspective or uh, on the outside? Like what, you know, what are your thoughts on like <laughs> the the launch or whatever? I, I'm 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 curious. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna take this one actually. Yeah, because um I was watching it uh, more from from afar, and I like I I one thing that that I've realized is that probably even if there was like a a lot of like extra um, like too much like fake creation like you couldn't like like you create like too much faith at first and like probably that that wasn't sustainable at first because there was like so many people that that like tried to uh, participate in the launch but like 
even then i think with your current design uh without like uh the penalties and the incentives like the current design and especially like the the v2 design i'm 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 thinking that it's possible that i think it was still 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 have worked right because if there was like a certainly less demand then people would just have, have like uh redeemed their faith for eth like in your current v2 design and like things would have went uh, smoothly possibly i think which is kind of interesting like even in those like kind of like adversarial like uh, conditions like probably would have still worked if like i'm thinking about this correctly yeah uh, i agree completely and the the old like your v2 is your v1 oh my god that's never been more true than with Faye. like Faye v1 was basically broken and Faye v2 is really the goal it's the protocol controlled value backed reserve um you know one to one redeemability, algorithmic risk management. It's like everything that Fav One should have been. And if we had launched with Fav Two, um, it would have really, really like we would be in a much different position now. And we're already in like an objectively really good position just from a protocol perspective. Um, like all the numbers are fantastic. The protocol is making like eight figures a year on yield. Um, you know, like we have a ton of DAO partnerships. Like that's really our product market fit is like working with other DAOs. Um, and yeah, like it took time to get here, but not that much time. That was six months ago or seven months ago, you know? So, um, it's pretty crazy how fast the space moves and, you know, we're just trying to learn and stay relevant and really like be on the edge with all these other like DeFi 2.0 DAOs or whatever. Like that's, that's where we're most comfortable. And, and I think that we're hitting our stride right now. You don't want to belabor too much on the launch, but I, 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 in general, you know, I think that. I don't know. I actually think the size of the launch was not the issue. I think the size of the launch was a good thing. I think that the getting that billion dollar in protocol control value is what gives sort of this flexibility to like sort of really, you know, take this thing to and like have scale and like start to, you know, that size of that PCB is what enabled sort of doing some of the DAO to DAO interactions that are going on, which we'll, we'll get into. Uh, I, I think that, yeah, personally, I think the only thing that could have that would have been solved would have been like, you know, like you mentioned that like instant 20% increase when instead maybe there should have been a little bit of a delay between the sale and the distribution of tokens. And that would have allowed for uh, sort of a, you know, I think that could have fixed it. But, you know, I want to talk sort of maybe let's go a little bit into uh, some of the technicals of like how Faye V1 worked. And so that way we can use that to like learn how, how Faye V2 uh, differs. So you want to just give like a brief overview for the listeners on what the mechanism of Faye V1 was and what was sort of the, like the main insight that you, you sort of brought in. Yeah. So Faye V1 was just complicated. Like uh, it had two peg mechanisms and one like sort of core engine, which is protocol controlled value that we're absolutely keeping for Fay V2. Like that was the big idea that I think is the, the real staying power. Um, in terms of maintaining the peg, Fay V1 had direct incentives and um, reweights where direct incentives were basically a penalty applied on trades um, if you're hurting the peg and a reward if you're going back to the peg. Um, sounded really nice. And like, you know, some simple models basically showed that it was like fine. But the problem was that ETH was like, super volatile and that it's a very soft touch kind of mechanism. Um, and when you throw a billion dollars at it, it just totally breaks. Can you talk about how does it break? Like what, what, what specifically breaks? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, look, if, if you're, if you're selling a stable coin and you're facing a 25% penalty, um, that's not a stable coin. It's worth 75 cents. If you can't sell it for a dollar, it's worth 75 cents. And that was the big problem is that the, the protocol effectively rugs liquidity when people want to sell. And that is like, um, you know, it, from a game theory perspective, like you would just hold it because you'd be like, well, someone else is going to take the penalty and I'm just going to hold it. But the, the problem is that um, game theory is like not a good way to design a DeFi mechanism. And like, I, I'm going to I'm going to stick to that. Like you want to have much like more more savage mechanisms like game theory works until it doesn't. We saw that with empty set dollar. Um, maybe someone will do it like, you know whatever, but you want to have like hard mechanisms. Um, three, three question mark. <laughs> I, I would love to talk about Olympus for a second. I, I, I like the project. They have an awesome community. 
um, in order to, like, we could talk about them if it comes up again, but, but basically, yeah, like, game theory is tough, man, and uh, so you need memes, you need hardcore community, they have it, we'll, we'll see how it goes, I'm, uh, I'm definitely cheering them on. That being said, so, so, like, there's this game theory aspect of direct incentives that didn't really work, uh, especially when you throw, like, hard adversarial conditions at it, um, because that's when you're, it's like, if, if you have any kind of unstable equilibrium, that is going to get snapped in half if you if you throw a lot of, of chaos at it. So, and then the reweights were like very innovative and and actually they worked. The, 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 the thing about reweights, you just bring the secondary market price back up to a dollar. And that's basically like redeemability, you know, but it's redeemability with this time component that you like reweight every, you know, so many hours. So what we realized was that it was just complexity for no real reason. It kind of gives advantages to bots and arbitragers. Like, um, so we just said, you know what? Screw direct incentives. We scrapped those really early. And then reweights, we transitioned to a redeemability model in, in, in June, in early June or end of May. And since then, the FAPEG has been like airtight. Um, so really, like I completely disregard those first two months of phase history as like, you know, learning in public and iterating on a very high risk mechanism, um, you know, and we, we made very safe moves. We moved slowly, carefully since the launch, we got it all sorted. And then, um, and then since then we were just like, put our heads down, plan V2, like Faye has been in this very like transitionary period since June, where we've been like scrapping old code, adding, like putting diversifying at like buying stable coins, doing all this stuff. And, now everything is like ready for v 2 which is like going to go live basically tomorrow um, with an asterisk. But yeah, like uh, really, really, really pumped about like the path and where we're going. I remember one of the things that was like sort of interesting about V1 uh, what, and I, or just the Faye idea was you were one of the first to sort of really try to tackle how do you do an under collateralized stable coin. Uh, you know, before that, everything was either over collateralized or like no collateralized uh and you 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 one of the one of the theses of Faye was that like hey is there something somewhere in the middle that gets a, some of the best of both worlds um is that still the goal or is is that something that has also transitioned away i'm glad you asked so basically what i have learned the hard way is that the only way to make a stable coin is to have redeemability um obviously like i don't i don't really believe in like absolutes so i'm sure that somehow somewhere someone's going to make a stable coin that doesn't involve redeemability but if you point to any stable coin that's working at scale it's redeemable for one dollar worth of something on both sides um terra is like this frax is like this usdc is like this die is like this with the psm um you know like any stable coin that works at scale is redeemable period um, or you have a rye like stable coin where it's volatile, um, but only like a little bit. And that's the only way, because otherwise the volatility has to go somewhere. So um, redeemability is like absolutely essential. And so it actually doesn't matter whether you're over or under collateralized. If you're redeemable at scale, then it's the other properties of your stable coin that are interesting. Whether you're over or under collateralized is just a symptom of your goals, right? Um, so under under collateralization in a vacuum is a negative property it's like you all things all things equal if you have redeemability you want more collateral you want collateral that's not your own token because like that's a you know systemic risk if you're collateralizing with your own governance token um when things go bad they go very bad and like it can work i i am very very like you know curious and optimistic about like terra and frax and um, you know, those teams are executing phenomenally. They have great ecosystems. Uh, the, the spirit of Fabi 2 is minimize dependence on internal assets. So tribe is like qualitatively different than Frax and Terra, even though it uses some similar mechanisms. And I would love to get into that. And the idea is like, let's have as much PCV as possible. Cause that's where we win, you know, like PCV is the moat. So we don't want to be under collateralized. We can be, but like in the long term, the mechanism should converge on either a hundred percent or monotonically in, not monotonically increasing, but like increasing collateralization and reserves. And it all depends on like 
how much demand there is for Fay versus how fast we can grow PCV. And like the V2 is designed to absorb under collateralization, but not stay there. That's pretty much the that's pretty much the the unlock. It's like you just need to have redeemability and then all collateral is good collateral. You've mentioned this term redeemability a couple of times. Can you, can you explain what, what does that mean and what does that look like? Yeah, so if you have an asset that you can sell for a dollar and buy for a dollar at all times, it's worth a dollar. That's the whole idea of like a stable coin. So when I say redeemability, I say you can mint Fay for a dollar worth of something. Right now it's ETH. V2 is going to be ETH and DAI. And we're going to add like other assets as well. Um, if you could buy it for a dollar and sell it for a dollar, it's a dollar. That's the idea. So you redeem it for protocol reserves, same way you redeem USDC for a dollar from Coinbase. Basically, the, the learning is that it's the, that's the only way to have something at, at exactly one dollar, right? Like, Dai tried to make this like, uh, and eventually realized like, yeah, I need something where the someone can come in and like literally exchange it for a dollar. Otherwise, it, it won't be like... Otherwise, it might be at 1.1, uh, 1.01, 1.02. Like, you can't really make something stick at exactly one dollar just with uh, game theory, like Joey was saying. Yeah, at least not not at this scale of DeFi, where everything is like you know thirty percent volatile a day. Uh, maybe if we have like you know, if you talk about like very very sophisticated financial markets, like. If the if the Fed if the Fed lowers interest rates by twenty five basis points, everyone loses their shit. It's like that that is not the world that DeFi is in right now. <laughs> um, and maybe like you could have more game theoretic, like soft touch institutional mechanisms. But I do have this suspicion that like the traditional finance industry is basically just run on like human algorithms. Like oh, the Fed lowered interest rates. I'm gonna go sell all these assets. Like I I don't think there's like it's just like all this like coordination at like a big scale. I don't, I don't think there's anything like objective about like interest rates directly affecting the economy on such a fine grained scale, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So Joey, like for the V2, um, is, uh, does the redeem re redeemability mean that you're like completely gonna like, um, like ditch the, the reweights and like, uh, directly balancing the Uniswap pool? Yeah, so reweights are gone. Um, and like, same thing with direct incentives. Like, both of these features in a vacuum are interesting mechanisms that were are not gone forever necessarily. But like, V2 is going to be fine without them. So, like, what we're going to do is we're going to build on Balancer. We're really like, we have a great relationship with that team. We did a treasury swap like a couple of weeks ago. And um, Balancer is kind of perfect for like a PCV system, you could have a ton of liquidity, you can rehypothecate assets. So if we do any kind of rebalancing, it's going to happen like using balancers mechanisms and not using like crazy custom code that we wrote. Um, so that, that's the idea, but V2 doesn't need it. It's probably not going to have it, um, at least not in the same way. Um, it'll look different if we if we add reweights back in. And I'm just curious, like, do you think that means, because right now it's like the, the liquidity on Fay and uh, ETH is like uh, hundreds of millions, right? Like, do, are you, do you think you're, you're going to, and that, that accrues like a lot of uh, improvement loss, right? Like over time. Do you think like you're, you could like reduce that, uh, that liquidity a lot since you? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to move it all into uh, probably a balancer pool. Um, and we might like weight it more towards ETH, like maybe 70, 30 or something. Um, so that way we're like maintaining some upside exposure to ETH. Um, and yeah, like, I think we're going to focus a lot more on what asset allocation do we want and like kind of putting, using balancer as a tool to have that asset allocation and algorithmically rebalance it versus like, oh, let's just have liquidity everywhere. That was a very like V1 mentality. And I don't think that's scalable because like in permanent loss and these things, like, um, we'd rather leverage solutions like Balancer and Tokamak and whatever to have the right liquidity in the right places and make the PCV composition what we want. Like it, um, that's like far more important, I think, than just like liquidity in a vacuum. Yeah, you mentioned that earlier uh, about like, you know, the PCV composition and like how like, you know, the goal should be like in increasing the PCV. Would it be like fair almost to like, in one way, think of like tribe as this, um, or, or, or like the PCV as this like 
fund that's being invested in and fit and like the fae that's outstanding are bond are like bonds and then the tribe is like shares in this like fund and so basically fae like tribe is this fund is like borrowing money from the bondholders will pay them back and then like the excess is captured by these shareholders that is certainly a mental model that you could use for at least some of the mechanisms obviously tribe is you know a governance token but um, given what it what it controls, it, it, it's a lot more than that. And so like tribe is kind of a direct, um, they are responsible for the future of the PCB. Like tribe holders vote on these assets. There's a buyback in Fay V2 that's algorithmically managed by the mechanisms. Um, tribe holders are heavily incentivized to protect PCV, grow PCV, maintain, um, you know, and grow the phase supply. Because um, Fay is like you said, like like debt against PCV. So really it's leverage for tribe holders. Tribe holders can earn yield on the whole PCV and it can send Fay into circulation, earn yield on that. And it can like have a productive, useful stable coin that like makes DeFi better. So really it's like an awesome, awesome mechanism that's really healthy if done right. You know, and it, it's, it's very flexible, which means there's a lot of booby traps and dangers, which is why like, you know, Fay Labs is hiring quantitative traders. We're like, we're really trying to like go deep on how to make sure that we can keep PCV safe and make the protocol safe because it's powerful and with great power comes responsibility. And like, I think that these PCV backed mega DAOs like Fay and Olympus and Frax are going to just absolutely take over in the, you know, in the next wave of DeFi. So that, that, that's pretty much the thesis there. And uh, I'm curious if you can talk about like, my favorite like potential use case for Fay is like um to solve the problem where like all these uh CDP um uh, collateral collateralized debt uh positions stablecoins like Dai like they need um they need a uh, PSM which is like this this thing where you like can redeem uh, you can redeem Dai for like one dollar of of something and right now it's USDC but I think my favorite potential use case is um um instead of using USDC, you could use like, uh, you could use Fay instead because Fay is directly redeemable for a dollar of something. So that I think, yeah, that's my, my favorite use case potential. Maybe if you can talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. So Fay really like the vision for Fay is to be decentralized USDC. That's what it is. It's like only decentralized assets in reserves, which are obviously volatile. So that means that we have to have very sophisticated portfolio management. And the problem is that there's not a lot of liquidity for hedging opportunities, like assets that can be stable relative to, um, you know, relative to the dollar. Like you can't put, like write a bunch of put options on ETH, you know, on chain right now. You can, but there's just no liquidity for that. So um, we have to resort to other mechanisms. Right now, Fay is like, semi-dependent on other stable coins and that's on purpose um we have lusd die and rye in the pcv right now we're looking at other options as well um so if we can get to a point where the market is mature enough that we can basically hedge portfolio volatility and continue to like earn reliable yield then they becomes an extraordinarily compelling um PSM asset. It's basically the on-chain USDC. That's been the vision. It's like, if you can buy it for a dollar, sell it for a dollar at all times, it's a dollar. And then we can truly break away from our dependence on USDC as an ecosystem. And I want Faye to play a huge part in that. Um, and so that's, that's really like, I would say we have like two North stars. One is like being the decentralized USDC. And two is being a home for DAOs, like a place for DAOs to have a ton of financial services. You know, the merge has a lot to do with that. We're building some really sick products for next year. Once V2 is shipped, it's going to be like heavily focused on on DAOs. Um, and yeah, those are like the two big use cases. So I think you hit it on the nose. We actually talked to Daniele and MIM is considering Faye for its PSM for, um, you know, for MIM, which I think would be really sick and kind of just validates this narrative, which I'm all about and is like, one of our main goals so it's pretty exciting to see the project get to that stage it's basically like two sides so uh, is that a right way to think about it is that you do you need like the um, 
you need like the customer, right? The, the the person that like wants Faye. So because of that, there's assets in the in the PCV. Because without people holding Faye, you 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 won't have assets, right? So it's so like someone like uh, Mim would be like a holder of Faye and then like a kind of like a depositor in the in the Faye DAO. Yeah, exactly. You have like the the people on the other side. The other side of the medal is the people that like want to like that can benefit from the the PCV, which is like DAOs, right? Like people that that need like LPing, people that need uh, like uh, just services in general that require capital. But without the depositors, you can't have anything because you don't want to have money in there, right? Yeah, so basically we're building a two-sided marketplace, right? Where you want people to hold Fay because it's the most decentralized and scalable stablecoin or at least one of them, right? And so MIM is exactly like a perfect or, you know, spell i guess so the, that protocol is like a perfect candidate for this and that's what i said by going hard on DAOs. we want to make use cases for DAOs to hold fey that's our like that's how we build the demand side and then the uh, the you know the supply side is easy or or rather like the demand to hold fey right the like to make more supply we just mint it you know we mint fey into fuse pools we mint fey into ave we mint fey like all over the place um that's easy as long as you're careful about your collateralization ratio and making sure that like all the mechanisms are are sound. Um, so yeah, it's really like building that demand side through DAOs and through the narrative that like Faye is on chain USDC. That's the real like vision. And um, I think Faye is very well positioned for like, you know, you know, the next the next phase. We're trying to stay on the edge of DeFi. We want to keep innovating. We're we're partnering with very innovative teams, staying on the edge, staying innovative, staying competitive. That's always been the vision. It's like a very like execution, innovation focused DAO. Okay, and uh, another one. Um, what's the, what's the like a uh, breakdown? Because you do you do need to think eventually. Like, what do I actually want to hold in the, in the treasury, right? In the PCV, right? What's the, what do you think? Like, I, I imagine like it's not you, it's the DAO, right? But what do you think? Like, which should be like a, a right uh, breakdown for, uh, like what you're holding in general. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is entirely dependent on the collateralization ratio. I actually think the current asset allocation is approximately perfect, which is, you know, it, it's good, right? Like we have 220, 50 million in stable coins. Um, and that's a mix of DAI, RAI, and LUSD. And I consider those to be like the three most liquid and decentralized candidates. Um, you know, like DAI is extremely liquid and it's censorship resistant, but it, there's some questions about its collateral composition. LUSD and RAI, are, there's no questions. It's like totally backed by ETH using CDP style mechanisms. Um, enough Lindy to feel comfortable holding them in size, but definitely not to be 100% dependent on them. So it's just like as much of kind of those type of stable assets as we can get comfortably. How did it acquire this stablecoin PCB? Because I remember it started off with ETH PCB. Yeah, yeah. So the like, I guess to wrap up that last thread, like, and then the rest we want to hold like a ton of ETH, and then good amounts of other like fully decentralized baskets. Um, we love like kind of the index co-op uh, product suite. Like we have some DPI, uh, maybe some data, maybe some metaverse index. Those are not in the PCV at the moment because we're kind of waiting for Fay V2. What's the percentage right now between e between stablecoin versus non? Yeah, so there's two different numbers that are important here. One is the raw like asset allocation. It's about 25% stables. Uh, but then if you talk about it in terms of collateralization, we're over 70% backed by stables. So ETH would have to really, really eat shit for the protocol to be in 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 danger. So it's awesome because we're free rolling a ton of ETH right now. Um, and that's a really good place to be in. So we're pretty much like short up for a bear. We're like, Faye, like Faye's going nowhere, basically. And that's the goal. Um, so so to answer your question on how we got these stables, um, we got the die and rye through bonding curves where we would like buy them at a small discount. Um, and we just let arbitrageurs kind of fill up our buffer. And then what we realized was that that's kind of like a, a little bit uh, of like, it's not like a totally sound mechanism, you know, cause you're just giving away like one or 2% spread just to acquire the assets. So 
what we started doing is we started using liquidity bootstrapping pools to basically auction Fay for um, assets. And that's how we got a hundred million dollars worth of LUSD with only like let like about 1% slippage, which is awesome given that there wasn't even that much LUSD in circulation. Like, the, you know, I mean, there is, but it's all in the stability pool. So like the market just kind of took care of it for us, this huge buy order that we placed over two weeks. Um, so we started, we're going to use more like automated tools like Bouncer to, to do these like asset um, rebalancing and acquisition and stuff like that. That's really cool. That's a cool use of the LVPs. Um, yeah, I wonder if you were just uh, sending a transaction on Uniswap and getting front run or something like that. So that's cool. No, we're, uh, dude, if you're, you got to move slowly and carefully when you have that many assets in, in public. So I'll, we're always thinking about how can we get front run? How can we avoid that? How can we like, you know, make these, these asset allocations in the open? And uh, it's something that we're, we're building a strong competency for. Who makes these decisions? Is it governance votes or is it, or does governance delegate to a more sophisticated treasury manager? Governance is totally controlled by tribe holders with the exception of the optimistic approval multi-sig, which is currently responsible for um, our liquidity mining and um, it can allocate Fay um, to some extent. It can like do like Fay um, liquidity as a service kind of stuff like infuse pools or with our Ondo partnership, but uh, asset allocations are totally controlled by the DAO. Um, that may not always be the case. Um, in Fay V2, we're gonna have risk curves, which are like an automated mechanism for rebalancing using Bouncer. So it's kind of uh, it's kind of like Compound has an interest rate curve that tells you programmatically what the borrower interest rate is and what the supplier interest rate is. But instead of controlling interest rates, you control asset allocations. And the input parameter is the collateralization ratio. So it's just a really cool, like automated function. Um, we're still doing a ton of analysis on how to like optimize that before launching it. That'll come in like probably March or April next year. We're also blocked on balancers timelines for releasing that feature on their managed pools. But um, but yeah, I wrote a really I, I like I've thought so much about governance that I, I wrote an article about it that I published last week. Maybe you could put it in the show notes or something. But it's about um, it's about governance and like where I see DeFi governance going. And I think that there's like three really critical aspects to any sufficiently complicated protocol. You wanna to have token governance, but you want it to be pretty light. Like at token governance should only control really important decisions. Like, um, you know, do we inflate the token supply? Do we change access control? Do we update contracts? Like that should be like, you know, very big decisions should be managed by token holders. And then I think you can delegate a lot of decisions to like a, a committee or like a group of like your specialized stakeholders. Most decisions in governance are just on party lines. It's like everyone votes yes. And to me, that's a sign that we're over utilizing token governance. Like token governance is an extremely heavy handed process. And if everyone's just going to vote yes on most things, then that's suboptimal use of, of resources, of gas, of all these things, of people's time and energy. So where I think we should go is more towards optimistic approval. I first heard of this idea through the gyroscope. Um, I think they're in testnet or something right now, but um, it's basically negative consent governance. It's not anything totally new, but it's that like you appoint a committee, that committee can make decisions, but there's a time lock. And during the time lock, the DAO can veto. And that's so much easier because I think people, when people want decentralization, they just want to say no when something's messed up. They don't want to be involved in every decision. And that's what I think, like, for example, um, you know, if people are getting censored on Twitter and stuff, like, because Twitter's centralized, like, the people should be able to vote and say, no, you can't censor that person. But they don't really care, like, what the algorithm does day to day. Um, and so uh, that that's my model for decentralized governance, is that the people want to just know what's happening. They want transparency, and they want to say no when they don't like something. And, and I think we're going to start leaning more and more on those types of mechanisms um, especially after the merge, because Tribe is going to very quickly become governing like a ton of stuff. So we can't do token governance for everything. Yeah, it's almost like Futarchy for governance, where like, if everyone can predict how governance would vote, you probably don't need to actually run the governance system itself. Yeah, dude, Futarchy is, Futarchy is crazy. I'm, I've, been, I've been obsessed with Futarchy since I first read that Merkle paper. But um, it just seems like so hard to, to program an objective function and like, 
DeFi is moving so fast that we can't have decades worth of data. But yeah, that that like, I can't wait to see smarter people than me solve governance. Like I don't know, state layer, state layer might do it. You know, on whatever whatever he does next. But state, are you working on solving governance? Uh, not right now. <laughs> but I, I did like that article. Uh, I think optimistic governance. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. Like uh, you delegate to uh, people and. Uh, if like the the governance holders still remain in control, they can still dissolve the the councils or whatever whatever is in place. I think that's the right model. Yeah, I I, I plan on posting something on the Sushi forum, trying to get them to use this model because I think like if they had optimistic governance, all this controversy would have just been like, oh, okay, no, the people voted no, you know, instead of giving absolute control to the treasury multi sig. Um, and I think the sushi team is like pretty on board for this. Um, it would be a big win for everyone. So uh, one other question about the PCB. You mentioned so you've mentioned balancer a bunch of times now. Um, so uh, you're not holding the piece. You're not holding the PCB in like a balancer AMF, right? It's like you're holding it. How how are are you? How, how do you what what do you mean by you're using balancer for this? So right now, Fay is basically a patchwork of PCB deposits which are just literally like wrappers around like yield generating assets like Compound, Aave, um, Fuse Pools, whatever. This is not a sustainable architecture. And I'm wrapping up the thread on the initial V2 launch and the merge. And then I'm going to spend a lot of time re-architecting from the ground up like a full stack kind of PCV system that's like more elegant um, and more streamlined. And that's going to involve Balancer very heavily. So what I'm imagining is basically balancer is kind of the top layer where everything is in a balancer pool that decides the macro asset allocation of the portfolio. How much ETH do we have? How much DPI do we have? How much RI do we have? How much LUSD do we have? And this is controlled by the risk curves at the very top level. And it should be pretty light. It shouldn't move that much because if you move too fast, you're moving the whole market. And if you move the whole market algorithmically, you're going to get destroyed by hedge funds and traders. And so um, we're doing a lot of analysis to make sure like what's a safe mechanism for that. But that's where I imagine the top layer being. And Bouncer has a cool feature where the way that they solve the capital efficiency problem is not by concentrating liquidity, but by actually giving you access to all the liquidity outside of the, the price band that you're in. So you could take assets out of Bouncer and put it into like some other deposit so what we're thinking is using the Fuse yield aggregators or RARI yield aggregators that are aggregating on top of Fuse as like a big component of PCV. So it'd be balancer on top and then yield generation sort of abstractly using these aggregators. And then at the base layer, we'd be using Fuse pools um, that would control kind of where PCV is going. So it's kind of this like full stack integration where you get lend you get swapping liquidity, lending liquidity and yield aggregation um kind of all all in in a hierarchy and that is a, a really nice architecture i'm gonna like do a whole write-up on it come up with a transition plan um from our current system and that's going to be like a big theme like early next year probably so um that's kind of the the alpha leak i guess for for where we're going after v 2 but when you're keeping your PCV in the balancer pool, does that mean that like it's suffering the IL? Because I've always heard like balancer try to pitch it as like, hey, this is you can build ETFs using balancer. But I always thought, isn't having it in a pool like a terrible ETF? Because you're like just you know whenever an asset goes up, you're like selling that asset basically. And like so, here's the thing: like when you're market making, like the goal is or like whether it's a goal or not, the idea of market making is like, you're always selling the asset that is in demand. Like if someone wants it, you're selling it to them and you're taking fees for that. Um, that is like market making is a, is a trade. It's a trade that's long volume and short volatility. So impermanent loss is like, it's a stupid name. Like it should just be called market making. Like that's the, that's the whole game. I guess the question is why are you market making with your entire PCB? So, so and then there's another question, which is that market making in an AMM is two things. It's it's actually a portfolio management tool. Like if you're an LP, you're making a specific trade on your portfolio. You wanna be 50% exposed to ETH and 50% exposed to USD if you're market making ETH Fay. Um, and maybe that's not what we want, 
But if we know what we want, we just plug it into Balancer. Balancer decides the asset allocation. And, you know, instead of thinking of it as selling on the way up, think of it as rebalancing. Like you're, you're rebalancing to have the asset allocation that you want at all times. And you're actually getting paid for that because people are swapping on your liquidity, giving you swap fees to have the asset allocation that you want. Does that make sense? Yes, but I'm going to claim that the balancer AMM is the opposite of what you want because like you mentioned, you know, 25% of your portfolios in stable coins right now, but it's 70% backed with, uh, with stable coin. But the problem is as ETH starts to crash, you guys are going to end up owning more and more ETH, which is crashing and less and less is going to be backed by stable coins. I would argue that you almost want the opposite with which, by the way, this is something we're working on at Osmosis, is you want a leverage AMM, which actually lets you sell ETH on the way down rather than buy ETH on the way down. Yeah, that, that's literally what we're building for v 2 We're building risk curves on top of Balancer that change the weights of the portfolio as the collateralization ratio changes. So we can actually, we're making an abstract generalization layer on top of Balancer that lets us do exactly what you're saying, where we can sell on the way down or buy on the way down or do nothing on the way down. And that's totally dependent on the, the inputs. Like we're, we're providing the function. And so like, yeah, like the answer is whatever we want, we can do. And we're doing a ton of upfront analysis. We have data scientists, quantitative traders on the team who are doing this analysis so that when we put it in, it, we have like a pretty good understanding of what's gonna happen. And then, you know, it's a very chaotic system. So if, if something happens we didn't expect, then we change the mechanism, we change the curve. Weren't you saying, Joy, that like uh, you were thinking like you might not not necessarily like put the whole thing in the in the balancer pool, right? You might just hold like a hold some outside of it, right? Yeah. So the the rollout and the architecture are still totally up in the air. Um, I think that it's very wise to start out like we're going to start moving pools over to balancer pretty soon, like the ETH Fay pool on Uniswap V2, there's no reason it should stay there. We're not getting any incentives and, you know, it's like, it's a dumb pool. So we're going to probably move that over to Balancer. Um, we're we're going to make a tribe pool on Balancer probably. So we're just going to keep like moving assets over to Balancer. And then eventually I do imagine that near 100% of PCB will be in Balancer. And maybe it's not 100, maybe it's like 50, but we want to build an ecosystem. We want to build a stack that we're like, I, I believe in like concentrating your resources, both from an architecture perspective and from like an alignment perspective. Like we want to own a ton of Val. We want to be a part of the balancer ecosystem. We want to pump TVL there, pump volume there. Um, same thing with the merge. Like the Rari merge is like, we want to put as much PCV into Fuse as possible and into Rari Vault as possible because like we're going to become one protocol. So that's the that's the idea there is like maybe not at once for technical reasons and security reasons we'll roll it out but eventually we're going to put as much as we can there um assuming that it, it, we have the properties that we want of pcv like the end goal is to just have the asset allocation we want in pcv at all times and we're going to use balancer as a tool to get there can you still have like uh some of it in like in balancer but uh like just like static like just like not actively being like Market mate, market mate with, or that's possible. At that point, we might as well just keep it outside of balancer. So it's it's really like that's that's what I mean. Like maybe we don't want to put our index in balancer because we want to make sure we're not ever selling it because we want to maintain one percent of the fully diluted supply of index. We'll just keep that outside of balancer, and we could do that with any amount of PCV. Like maybe we just like always want to have a hundred thousand ETH no matter what, and we're just gonna keep that outside of balancer forever and put it in stake teeth and just leave it there. Like, you know, we could do stuff like that. Um, definitely like, I don't, I don't believe in doing anything arbitrarily. Like we shouldn't put it all in balancer just cause we should do it because we have a very specific goal. So having a lot of smart people in the community like you and you know, all the, the various stakeholders kind of pitching in and deciding like what we want to make this thing, that is what I'm going to support and provide technical resources for. We, so we so okay. We talked a lot about uh, what happens in like the over over collateralized regime. Like you know, ideally everything is one for one redeemable for something in the PCB. What happens when the PCB gets if the PCB gets completely drained 
And, you know, because we offer this one-to-one redeemability, now that, that means that there's outstanding faith. What happens next? You're saying we're under collateralized in this scenario or what? Yes. I, yeah, yeah. What happens if what happens if we're under collateralized? Uh, but, you know, you still keep and you keep offering one-to-one redeemability, but then we're all out of and we get and all the uh, PCB gets wiped out. Yeah, I mean, that's a textbook bank run. So that's the V2 is designed to avoid that. We have two mechanisms to avoid that. One is if we go under the target collateralization ratio, we backstop with tribe. And that's the only scenario where tribe is used to absorb volatility on the downside is if we go under the collateralization ratio. The target's going to be 100%. Um, There's technical reasons why it shouldn't be over 100%. um, And we can actually lower it. We can lower it to like 90 or maybe even 80. But... um, you want to keep that number pretty high because like you don't want anyone to be scared. Like if people are like, Oh, Faye is 90% backed, that's going to be fine in pretty much all market conditions. Um, so as long as there's this like guarantee from the protocol to backstop with its own equity, when shit hits the fan, that's like a really good way for people to kind of like feel comfortable. We also have a rate limit on how much tribe can be inflated at a given time so that tribe holders are not freaking out and like dumping to front run any inflation um and then like i said the risk curves are going to be selling into stables basically as pcb goes down so um there's all these mechanisms to kind of stop us from getting under collateralized but if we do like tribe is there as a backstop um and if we get so under collateralized like black thursday like you know i i guess in an extreme scenario phase zeroes out that's like you know, we're doing everything in our power to make that not happen. And I'm extremely confident in the mechanisms, but like if things had gone much worse on black Thursday, MakerDAO wouldn't be here right now. So that's kind of the, or yeah, I think it was black, black Thursday or Monday. I don't know, whatever, whatever happened in March of 2020, if it had gone much worse, MakerDAO would be toast. And so like, that's the risk and that's what we're building to protect against. But yeah, like, you know, it's DeFi, you can't have an airtight mechanism when you're doing something this complicated. So it's all about like on-chain incentives, asset reallocation, mechanisms to protect against the backstop event. That makes sense. Um, one funny thing I was thinking about before, right, while prepping for the show, was uh, if you actually allowed redeemability or mintability of tribe first, right, before it is at the collateralization ratio, it kind of becomes like Terra, but with a bat with like an ETH backstop. So, you know, the whole thing with like Terra is like, how does it work? Well, the TFL balance sheet is backstopping it. But here it's like, hey, there's this on-chain balance sheet, which it, it, you, you create Terra, but this on-chain balance sheet is what's backstopping the protocol, which is kind of cool. Here is the difference between Faye and Terra. Um, and I love this analogy. I think like, I think it makes a lot of sense to me. So like, let me know if it doesn't make sense. But basically, um, Luna is absorbing volatility in UST demand directly. When Luna, when UST goes over a dollar, Luna gets bought and burned. When UST goes under a dollar, Luna gets minted and inflated. Um, Fay backs the peg with hard assets, ETH, other stable coins like PCV. So the peg is completely managed by PCV and Tribe is absorbing volatility in the PCV. So it's kind of like Luna with an extra step where it's managing volatility in the assets, not in demand for the stable coin. Yeah, I, I, I think like for me, I, I remember like I was always very skeptical of Terra and I, I guess I just never understood it um, until I saw understood Faye. And I think Faye to me was like this like stepping stone where I like at least I understood the game theory of Terra. I'm not, it's still something that's a little bit, you know, will it blow up in a good way or a bad way? I don't know. We'll see. But uh, I, I think that, that that definitely helped me understand Terra much better. Yeah. And uh, then the reason why we're obsessed with being fully collateralized is because we're nervous about mechanisms like Terra. Like we've seen Titan zero out after a $2 billion supply. And like, there's a bunch of things that went wrong there. But the market has been in our favor for a year and a half now. Um, that's not going to, it's not going to be like that forever. So, um, you know, we want to have a mechanism that can weather the storm and like a really gnarly storm. Because I think, you know, I remember March 2020. I remember, you know, 
2018, like shit is not always very pretty. It's like, it's brutal sometimes, you know? I was like a, a hyper, hypothetical like scenario. Like the only way I could see like Faye become like close to uh, Luna would be like if Faye would swallow up like so much ETH that like ETH would be like really like uh, like ingrained like with uh, with Faye itself, right? <laughs> like <laughs> then that would be closer to Luna, right? Because basically there's a point where Faye selling could affect the market, right? Yeah, I mean, we are at that point. It's just like not, it's not like if Ether would like get destroyed if we unloaded everything, but the ETH price went up 10% during Thay Genesis and the gas price went up like 200%. I'm pretty sure that like us sucking up, you know, almost a full percent of the ETH supply was like definitely moved the price. And we still have like, you know, a quarter of a percent of the ETH supply. So we're a, we're a huge actor. We're probably one of the largest ETH holders as an entity in the entire ecosystem. This is a, I'm just having this crazy idea now, like right now while we're talking. So this might make zero sense. But what I, I mean, so what, what one thing I was mentioning just this state earlier was like, hey, what if like the the Fav one idea? What like, but you had like the redeemability. Uh, let's say you had something more like. Terra, where like you mint and burn tribe for, for uh, USD, uh, for, sorry, for Fay, but then you used your PCV to instead of market making on ETH Fay like V1 was doing, you instead used the to market make on ETH tribe instead. And you basically have like, hey, here's this like exit liquidity for, uh, for, uh, tribe out and it's like i don't know that feels very interesting but then what i just thought about just now was like i wonder if there's like this a way of like using this with like an olympus style mechanism to keep like increasing the um pcv and then like i wonder if olympus could issue a stable coin with like their actual so you know you know actually earlier on in the thing you were you were, you were offering up your views on olympus maybe Maybe we can do that and then we can talk about that a little bit. Because I remember back when like Faye was, when it was first like launching and stuff, I remember at the time, like uh, everyone was talking, like the two things, everyone's like, oh, two big stable coins coming out right now, Faye and Ohm. And clearly Ohm does not seem like a stable coin right now. So what do, what do you think is like about, what are your thoughts on Olympus? Yeah, so um, the, the spiritual core of both protocols are identical. It's a PCV backed asset period. Like Faye is a PCV backed USD stable coin. Ohm is a PCV backed futuristic reserve currency that has a floor price. Um, and so in that, re in that regard, I think Olympus is one of the coolest things ever because I think Faye is one of the coolest things ever. And they're very similar. Um, the way that Olympus is different is that they use staking and bonding to kind of growth hack this like PCV or protocol on liquidity. Um, it's super sick. Like, I don't, I have no idea what's going to happen. I, um, like, I don't, I don't have any own bags, but I really like the team. I like, um, you know, I like the community a lot. I I'm always, I always hedge when I talk about it. Like it's a dangerous mechanism. I think even the leadership kind of knows that it's like not to be trifled with. So all the memes and shit are fun, but, um, you know, it's trading, you know, eight or 10 X over its reserve value at any given time. And that could zero, not zero, but that could, you know, that could do a five X dip at any point. Um, and everyone's kind of aware of that. And, but like, they have such a strong community and the market's been in their favor. Like they're acquiring so many assets, like Olympus is not going anywhere. And I think that's the long-term play is like, even when shit hits the fan, they just pivot to being more like a stable coin and less like a, like a growth machine, you know? Um, I, uh, yeah, I have, I have, I have like a very nuanced, like I'm, I'm, I'm following Olympus very closely. I'm, I'm, you know, like, I think that they're really executing pretty well. And that's my, that's my like broad take on, on Olympus. It's, it's funny because like, uh, one of the, uh, cause I have like a lot of like, uh, Omi's friends. Right. And like one of the ways I like, kind of like explain them fair, or like pill them on fair was like. Imagine if Olympus was to like issue like a an asset like a like a stable coin that's like fully backed by their their PCV right because they have like hundreds of millions like they could do that like tomorrow they could issue like a well maybe not tomorrow but you know uh, like 
uh, issue a stablecoin, it's just essentially like Fay and just sell when it's over one dollar and and uh, buy back when it's under one dollar, right? Uh, so like that's kind of how like sometimes I explain the uh, Fay because like Tribe would and Om would become essentially like Tribe, right? Because it would be just like the the governance token and like uh, they get like the upside on the PCV growing and everything. So that's, that's kind of like one way. <laughs> Dude, that would be a crazy timeline. If Olympus just like launches a stable coin and turns Ohm into a governance token, that would be an absolute, that's a crazy timeline. Yeah, so that's exactly what I was just thinking. It seems that the mechanisms are very similar, but what Ohm did was it packaged Tribe and what, what in, in Faye is two separate tokens, one which is stable and one which is this like accruing value asset because it's like, proportional to, uh, to the PCB, it packages them into one asset. But it would be, but I feel like Ohm maybe could separate these out where like, you know, they have this like lower value that's backing the Ohm, but it's clearly under collateralized there. They could issue a stable coin based off the floor value and then have this other thing become this like PCB tracking asset. It, it seems like that's a little bit what's going on here. Oh my God, that, that, that's so sick. I don't think yeah. they want to do that. I, I've talked to, like, I've suggested, like, oh, could you do this, like, to some friends, like, OG Omis, and they were like, yeah, that's not, that's not, like, the, the vision, right? Because they want the asset itself to become the the reserve currency, but I think it's a cool, it would be cool, right? And they could, they could make it so that it's not, it's not, like, fail, like, exactly one dollar, it could be uh, more of a, like, a floating one, right? Like, uh, let's say it's, like, yeah. uh, they, they don't let it go past 1.05, but they might, you know, that that type of thing. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, like, they should keep it as just Ohm, right? Like, they should stick to what they're good at. That's been the narrative. That's been the vision. And, like, if they can execute it, it's fucking huge. And, like, you know, I I definitely think, you know, it's worth it's worth giving that its, its full shot, right? Um, so, but if they want to launch a stable coin, call me. I could, I could give you some tips. <laughs> What is the PCB right now, the, the dollar value, approximately? Uh, yeah, East been tanking, so my guess is it's around a billion. It was like 1.2 uh, a week or two ago. Um, yeah, it's, it's almost exactly a billion as of right now. Okay, so there's, a, so there's about $1.2 billion of PCB and about $750 million of outstanding FAY, right? Yeah, but half of that Fay it's seven hundred, and half of it belongs to the protocol. So in terms of debt, there's like three hundred fifty million. Okay, so then maybe let's talk a little bit about uh, this uh, Rari merger. Um, so you know, what, what, maybe before we go into the merger, like you know, what was this like relationship, and like what was the interaction between? the Fay protocol and the Rari protocol before any talks of merger even popped up. Yeah, I mean it's it's really a perfect fit. Like Fay is a, you know, Fay is a stablecoin looking for a product and Rari is a product looking for a stablecoin. Like they have a leverage market, but you need liquidity particularly in stablecoins to, you know, satisfy the demands of people who want capital efficiency against their tokens. And so we basically put Faye into every fuse pool we could. We have Faye in like, you know, like nine of the top 10 fuse pools or something like that, maybe eight or nine of the top 10. And, um, you know, a ton of pools, like all the top pools have Faye in it because we put liquidity in them and then that attracts capital. So um, very strong relationship on the mechanism level. Also the teams just like really gel, very, very similar vision, execution style, very aggressive, innovative um like wanting to be on the fringe and like you know be the ones kind of leading the charge like that's always been like jay's vision their team is is phenomenal and great to work with so um when when jay first like floated the idea by me it's funny because i had actually been thinking about it for a while i thought like man what if we like merge with rari that'd be so cool and then jay was like dude what if we merge protocols to me and it just felt right when he said it, but we spent a lot of time kind of syncing up with the teams, getting everyone on board. Um, you know, it's a big, big decision. It's like getting married. And um, so that's kind of how we like got here. And then once the teams were all totally on board, we took it to the community. No one else knew about it. We didn't tell any of our investors or anything. It was literally just like from the core teams. And then we took it to the community, got a ton of attention. 
um, had some really great conversations. It's honestly been the coolest example of decentralized governance I've ever been a part of. Um, Cause you have two different communities trying to negotiate all these different narratives, all these different stakeholders, really, really like people showing up to like contribute value and like, you know, fight for their, you know, their protocol. Very awesome kind of process and cool to, you know, cool to be a part of. Was there a vocal minority that was like very against the merger? Yeah, I mean, I think calling it a vocal minority might even be like, um, you know, belittling like the sentiment. Like there were people who were very upset on both sides. I have no idea what like on the tribe side, it wasn't even a minority. It was like all the biggest tribe holders were like, dude, what are you doing? And, uh, um, you know, there was a lot of like negotiation and, and we changed the proposal a ton to really make it work for like all the key stakeholders and as much of the community as we could. And Jay and I have been like really emphasizing the vision of what we can do together. And oh my God, is it going to be sick? Like, get ready. Um, and so, yeah, like there's a ton of detractors when we first proposed. Most of that was because people just, it was out of nowhere. Like no one was expecting this because it only makes sense after you spend like some time, like thinking about it and looking at where DeFi is going. And um, so we think that this is like a very forward move that, you know, Already we're seeing like the spell ecosystem, like they're consolidating a ton. I think they're trying to merge with sushi right now. Like we're going to see consolidation all across the DeFi stack. And so it's like, choose your friends. And I know who my friends are and I want to merge with these guys. And like, um, you know, I'm trying to sell this vision to people who aren't into it, but ultimately we're, we're letting people who aren't into it kind of exit. Like tribe holders get the rage quit. RGT holders are going to swap into an asset that's 10 times more liquid. So everyone's going to have the ability to leave if they don't see this new vision. And um, it still needs to go into on-chain vote. So it's ultimately still a decision by token holders. And uh, I'm pretty confident that it'll go through and we'll like we'll be able to execute something really awesome. The, it looks like the snapshot vote is currently uh, at 99.99% yes. So it looks like it's probably going to go through as of, at the moment. Yeah, it was the most voted on snapshot ever in Fay protocol by a long shot. 10% of the supply showed up, fully diluted supply. So it was like, of all of the tribe that could even possibly vote, over half of it showed up. And Fay Labs participated very minimally. Like I didn't vote, Seb didn't vote, most of our investors didn't vote. It was very just like totally community. Like I'm so, I'm actually floored at how positive it was received by the community after we, after we added the rage quit and changed the proposal. Like everyone was on board. Even the people who like aren't down for this new vision are down because of the rage quit. They're like, yeah, like you guys do your thing. I just want to take my Faye and get out of here. And um, I think that's going to be a really positive kind of healthy moment for DeFi as a whole, but particularly, you know, the Faye community and the Rari community. It's going to be, it's going to be really, you know, a powerful event. Yeah. I mean, I, I, that's very interesting about this whole ecosystem thing because that's something I find I, I see happening as well. Where it's like you know, you you know you, you take a stable coin, you take a lending protocol, you take a dex, and you you got to package them all up. And so you know, like you mentioned, you know, I think you know this is happening in Terra. I think this is happening in like as you mentioned in like the spell commute ecosystem with, that Daniel Esta is like uh, put, putting together. So you, you, is that really where you see like sort of tribe going as well, where it's like, okay, uh, you know, you have this like stable coin, you have this lending protocol, eventually you guys are obviously going to acquire balancer, alpha leak right here, blah, blah. Uh, is that where you see where this is all going? Absolutely. I think like tribe is, uh, tribe, like new narrative, basically, like I want tribe to be synonymous with DeFi in like two years, you know? Um, and that's the, that's the real vision is it's like full stack a bunch of very values aligned teams all independently contributing value. Like I'll continue to lead the stable coin side for as long as I can. And I'll try and help with this like broader vision, but everyone, I want to bring in leaders. I want to bring in people who can like build a product and help us integrate and create a really full stack experience for DeFi. And we're going to use PCV to make that really, really kick ass. And like, that's the trick is that everyone who integrates with us gets hundreds of millions of TVL immediately. And if you and if you're a builder and you're like thinking about like what's going to happen to DeFi when everyone consolidates, like, 
and you're and you're like excited about what we're doing with like Faye and Rari and you know we're already in talks with other teams and like it's going to happen and we want to talk to you if you want to build on us like dm me it's a really powerful value proposition when you have this tightly knit community that's sharing resources um and like fostering leadership you know like i want teams that are i want to see like people fighting for like what they believe in like in governance and like really sharpening the sword and not just like one team kind of saying what's happening. And that's what's happening a lot with Faye right now. And I think we're doing a good job as kind of stewards with the community and we're, we're elevating the community more and more. But when you add in more development teams and more products, so you really get something magical where it's, it's like true decentralization and that's what we're going for. So you met, I remember there was this one line in I think the governance proposal or somewhere, but it, it said like different compete separate communities in one token what exactly does that mean so i do think that in particular the communities i really want to like mesh together because like rari is maintaining its own brand and Faye is maintaining its own brand but tribe is like the umbrella and um i think that there's like you know it's kind of like everyone who's on the terra ecosystem you have like anchor protocol and like i don't even know what what other stuff is over there but like that's all over on Terra and everyone still like identifies very strongly with like Luna and the whole, and it's like Ethereum almost like communities within communities. I want its tribe to become like an asset that represents a lot of different communities that all come together. And like, I care a ton about tribe and I care a ton about ether. Like I'm buying as much ether as I can get my hands on right now. And like, I want people to like also feel that way about like tribe and have multiple teams all like building on tribe that's really the vision. Um, so the development teams will stay independent, but there'll be much more resource sharing. I'm actually on calls with the Rari team almost more than the Faye team these days because like we're planning so many integrations and so much about the merge. So um, yeah, it's going to be very fluid and kind of like, you know, authentic decentralization at kind of the DAO level scale. One thing that I guess makes this merger intra different is like, so like, this is probably the large. Is this the largest like token merge in like crypt ever in crypto, or, or do you know if there's any larger ones? I don't know of any larger ones, and it's definitely the coolest if it's not the largest, because it's two. It's it's so. Here's the thing: it's two teams with product market fit. That's that's what's so cool about this is that like other mergers, it's like you take one dying thing and one thing that's not dying, and you like put them together. Um, this is like two teams that would have continued to kick ass if we stayed separate forever. But we just saw that like one plus one equals three. That's like the meme that we're going for right now. Like you take two things that are already good and you put them together, you get something like that's greater than the sum of the two parts. And that's really the, that's really the vision and why it's so cool in my opinion. What are, I remember last year, there was this whole thing about like sushi and yearn are merging and that they're going to share a depth but then i never heard there was like a blog post about this but i never heard about it again what was like the deal with that look i mean here's the thing like the yearn ecosystem tried to do this they realized that consolidation is power and to be fair the the yearn ecosystem is powerful but because they have all these separate tokens there's not really a ton of incentive alignment so people are kind of just doing their own shit. and it was honestly pretty lackluster in execution um, and then the sushi, sushi tried to verticalize DeFi by building every single product possible with one development team. And that didn't go well either. So what Jay and I realized was that even though it's painful to smash two tokens together, it's the right way to do it. And, um, like we are going to continue on our product roadmaps. We have specialized expertise in what we're doing, but we have dramatic incentive alignment because we have one token instead of two. And we think that that's the model that consolidation will like will win and um so it's really a bet on like a certain type of consolidation that's at the token level and that's that's what that's the bet that we're making yeah because even if you make a large token swap like when you think about it like yeah maybe you'll be happy if the other protocol does well because you're like yeah we own some of the token but it's really not the same in the sense that like in the at the end of the day you're still rooting for your token and you want like your token to do well and like that's not probably the only way to like actually be on the same on the same side the same team is like you need to have the same token right like otherwise you're gonna want to you're gonna want the best for yourself uh, that's just natural 
Yeah, exactly. So that, that was the key intuition. And this was a common criticism from a lot of community members. Like, why don't we just do a token swap? It's like, well, we've done token swaps with other teams and we still do them. I think they're, they're very useful and important, but it's a totally categorically different type of incentive alignment. Like we love index coop, but we would not like give them PCV for any reason. Right. Like we would, we would buy DPI and we would use it and like do stuff like that. But with Rari, it's like, we are going to put assets into their protocol. We are going to pay off their hack. We are going to do development with them. Like, that is true incentive alignment and that's what a token merge gets you that a token swap doesn't so what are some of the plans for the future for for i guess Bay and rari now and the tribe ecosystem as a whole how do you what what's yeah so you know Faye, you mentioned Faye v2 is launching tomorrow um what 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 are the thing what are the um assumptions that you're looking to validate from this launch tomorrow yeah, so the Fey V2 launch, it's it's really like Fey is kind of the ship of Theseus. Like it's it's one system that has a bunch of changing components all times. Like even today, before the Fey V2 launch, the only contracts that are the same from Fey V1 are the Fey token, the tribe token, and our one access control core module. Every single other contract has been completely replaced since Fey V1. So it's already like Fay V3 if you think about it in like a pure like software perspective. But the thing is that we're going to keep like adding new components and replacing old components. Fay is like a very fluid system and it uses a different architecture than most Ethereum projects. Like it's immutable, but with like very modular. So we don't have any upgradability except for two contracts in the system. Everything else is just plug and play like Legos. You get rid of something old, put in something new. Um, so... The Fay V2 launch tomorrow includes two really important features. It includes the tribe backstop, as well as a rate limiting module on tribe inflation, which is useful for tribe holders to kind of game out. Like there's no infinite minting attacks. There's no like craziness. Like there's a hard rate limit on how much tribe can be inflated. And two is the die uh, redeemability contract. It's really a PSM, just like MakerDAO. Um, and that is the most important mechanism because right now we have redeemability against ETH which is great, but it on its own, it's a little bit leaky because the Chainlink Oracle is not perfect. It's the best that we have, but it's not good enough to um, not leak value to arbitragers and predictive, like, you know, predictive bots and stuff. Um, so we're adding a die redeemability contract. What's awesome about this is that it's categorically different from the MakerDAO PSM. MakerDAO does not control how much USDC they have. They only have a cap. It's not PCV. They can't unload that USDC anywhere. Um, we can decide how much die exposure we want. It's currently 10%. Um, it's going to go up to, I think, 12 or 15% after this next DAO vote passes. But um, that is a number that we control as a DAO. So like MakerDAO doesn't control how much USDC backing there is. It's totally market determined. But we can say, we're going to sell all this die or we're going to buy more. And that's totally up to us. So um, we can we can decide the the level of dependency that we have which is really powerful um and so we just want to see that like that redeemability tightens the peg spares us from like buying and selling eth all the time um and then we can focus on kind of the the fun part which is what happens after the merge we're going to build a ton of products that focus on um you know like DAOs. i have one product in particular that i'm really excited about and and then like some future plans that i'm super excited about so what is the what's your you know i think every every protocol is you know kind of mandated at this point to have a plan for multi-chain or interchain uh what it, what it, what, it, what is yours guys is looking like i'll admit i've made one ethereum transaction in the last month because a little part of me dies every time i pay a transaction fee that's over a hundred dollars yeah so our multi-chain strategy is like not right now pretty much. Um, and and that, that's changing rapidly. But basically, Fey is a protocol for DAOs and DAOs operate at a scale that is still comfortable on Ethereum layer one. Um, so we're going to stay where the DAOs are. We're not, Fey is not a stable coin for consumers. We're not competing with DAI and USDC. We will eventually, but our, um, our like foot in the door is DAOs. Like, I, I'm not concerned with how many retail users are holding Fey because it's such a hard sell. It's like, Faye is a stable coin that's not, doesn't have as much of Lindy. 
Um, it's not as useful as DAI yet, but it's quickly becoming integrated everywhere. Um, so why would we try to compete there when Faye is literally the best stablecoin to integrate with a DAO and all the DAOs are on mainnet? Um, so we're staying on mainnet with the DAOs basically um, until L2 is more certain. Right now it's kind of a shit show. It's like, do you go to Arbitrum? Do you go to Optimism? Oh, ZK Sync is coming. Like, you know, we're, we're going to just wait and see. You go build tribe chain. That's the answer. Dude, low key, that's going to happen. But don't like, like that's the mega alpha leak is like, I don't know when, but that, that will happen. Low key on this podcast with 10,000 listeners. <laughs> don't tell anyone. There's one cool <laughs> multi-chain thing uh, that, that you probably could do or probably will do if I'm guessing. Like, um, uh, so trans- Transmissions and Rari, like they've been working on this Nova thing where it was like a protocol for like, uh, like you can use for fast bridging uh like between rollups or, or chains and like the, the 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 hard problem with these uh protocols for for like uh interchain and like fast bridging is like you need capital like so phase like a perfect fit because they can literally just print into these these fast bridges and like use their use their uh their their, their protocol of nova for for and do that so that's kind of like a multi-chain type thing yeah absolutely so basically like Stay core is staying on L1 for a long time, probably until it's very clear that we need to move. Um, but launching products and certain amounts of PCV onto other chains is in the works at the moment. Um, like Transmissions is working on it. Uh, David's working on it. One of our developers, Caleb, is working on it. Uh, basically, we want to joint launch Fuse and Fay on a bunch of chains. And I think Fuse is getting a little bit of a head start because their devs are more focused on that than ours are at the moment. But we will get there. Um, so well, imagine like Fuse is on all these other chains, Faye is seeding pools there, but it's not like core PCV is on these other chains yet, if that makes sense. You could get it on, os- on osmosis too. Uh, well, Charlie, thanks for coming on and uh, you know sharing all this uh, fun stuff about Faye and Tribe and everything going on. Um, and where, where can uh, people sort of like find you and learn more and what's the best way to, for people to get involved? Yeah, absolutely. So um, follow the Fay Protocol Twitter account. It's just at Fay Protocol, no spaces. Um, or me, I'm Joey underscore underscore Santoro. I tried to buy a better Twitter handle. If anyone knows how to do that, I will I, I will get one. But um, that and then join our Discord. I think the Discord links in our Twitter bio. So um, you know, we want to hear from you. DM me, especially if you're a builder looking to join a sick Mega DAO ecosystem. Um, and yeah, like, thanks again for having me. This was, this was awesome. Thank you.